Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Mark, thank you for that introduction. I can barely wait to hear my own self speak, having heard you being so generous in your introduction. But it's great to be here on a subject of significant importance. And it's a perspective from a country way down in the South West Pacific called, as you know, New Zealand. Now, a world famous opera singer was once asked what he thought of folk singing. He replied that all singing is folk singing. After all, when did you last hear a horse sing? Diplomacy is like that. It's about people and about being about people. Diplomacy is about culture or rather about understanding the culture of others. Now, New Zealand is a country which people have immigrated to for over 1,000 years. It was first populated by Maori, then about eight centuries later by settlers from other countries. Incidentally, uh, from the speaker who preceded me, uh, the Maori and the people about which we speak in the South Pacific, 5,000 years ago came from China. The DNA is irrefutable. And now, our recent history shows that 70% of the population uh, identifies themselves as being European. That's English, Scots, Irish, Welsh, Dutch, Australian, Croatian, American, and quite a few others. It also shows the indigenous Maori being nearly 15%, Asians nearly 12%, and Pacifica people being nearly 7.5%. Now, the Maori are from Polynesia, and Polynesians are found all across the Pacific from New Zealand all the way, Niue, Samoa, Tonga, all the way, Pitcairn, Easter Island, and on to Hawaii. Now, within the broad Asian category, we have Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Korean, Japanese, and many other Southeast Asian people. Our statistics agency estimates that we currently have more uh, cultures and ethnicities in New Zealand than there are countries in the world today, and it's a recent phenomenon. Over the last quarter century, there's been an astonishing transition in the makeup of our society. And we are actually a modern experiment in diversity. We cannot say at this point that it's been entirely successful. What is recently significant is how many or how large numbers of migrants have been absorbed into New Zealand, replacing record numbers of New Zealanders seeking better economic and other opportunities abroad which probably explains why our recent population transformation has been achieved with tolerance by New Zealanders. This experience of accepting large-scale immigration also owes something to the history of my country. Remember, when significant European settlement began in the 1800s, it was by way of colonization from Britain, at a time when nations were being colonized all around the world. The history of that settlement and the relationship between Maori and British settlers was far from perfect or always harmonious. Incidentally, I'm half Maori and half Scots. There's nobody perfect. As they say, one half he wants to get drunk, the other half doesn't want to pay for it. Or, you're born with a natural suntan and a desire to save money. Now, back to my point. The impact on the native Maori society was profound. The outcome was by no means ideal, but progress and improvement was possible because the parties talked to each other, significantly intermarried, played sport, and indeed went to church together. And New Zealand soon successfully forged an effective and stable, thank you very much, and stable democracy that was in many ways the model of a progressive and enlightened society, and for decades, we were in per capita or earnings per head number two or three or one in the world. And the Minister for Labor knew everyone who was unemployed because there wasn't 28,000 or 280,000 or 28,000 or 2,800, but just 28 in total. And he knew all of their names. So we were a very successful experiment. Our society worked because there has been a broad agreement on the principles of parliamentary democracy, a broad agreement on the rule of law, and a de degree of mutual respect between the Maori and the community of settlers that came. And today one could suggest that what New Zealand uh, has done, or what has happened in New Zealand, is of relevance to the wider world. 
Which brings us to the issue of cultural diplomacy, which often evokes a sense of nostalgia or a longing for an earlier age. For much of New Zealand's history, and our early history, we were beset with the tyranny of distance. It's a long way out in the Southwest Pacific. It colored our thinking and affected our developing culture, our literature, and the way we saw people and events. It's encapsulated in the New Zealand expression, a fair go. We seriously began to believe that everybody should get a fair go, whatever their background was. So distance, isolation, and security fears all played a role in New Zealand's development. Only a few decades ago, our diplomats went overseas to report on and to interpret and explain their host countries to New Zealand governments that back home had few resources or sources of information about how overseas developments might imp impact on our national interests. It was a time when a government-funded cultural event offshore was probably the only avenue for showcasing New Zealand and its emerging culture to the world. It was simply too far, too expensive, and too seldom. Now the impact of the indigenous people of New Zealand's art exhibition in the United States cities of New York, St. Louis, uh, Chicago, and San Francisco in 1984, under the exhibit line Tamari, which means the Maori, was highly successful. People began to understand that there was more to New Zealand than three and a half million people and 70 million sheep. Equally, this was a time when a visit to New Zealand by the Soviet-era Moscow Ballet would cause a real stir. It was a rare event, even though most of us knew at the time that this was propaganda masquerading as cultural diplomacy. But then, to be fair, all cultural diplomacy, where culture is used as a tool of foreign policy, is propaganda in some sense of that word. In that now bygone era, governments, though careful and through careful use of funding for cultural promotion overseas, could influence the image they wanted to project internationally. All this was important to small countries like New Zealand because soft power is all we have at our disposal. We are not and could never be in the game of coercive diplomacy. But things have changed dramatically and to be honest, the ability of governments to influence how the world sees us is now much more complicated. It's also much more expensive in the sense that you saw we, the people and the countries making a contribution in the Philippines uh, and for a country like ours to be engaged in 21 theatres of peacekeeping is very, very significant. As I say, things have changed dramatically and to be honest, the ability of governments to influence how the world sees us is now much more complicated. When YouTube videos go viral and seen by hundreds of millions within days, when bad news ricochets around the world in minutes, governments can only react and, us and usually belatedly so. In the modern digital age, the image of New Zealand that most international audiences hold is dominated by things the government cannot and should not control. For example, the image of the All Blacks performing a haka before a rugby international. You may have seen one, you may not have. But rugby is a very much a rising game and shortly we'll be in the uh, Olympics in uh, South America and Brazil at the next games. It's when they dance around before the game and stick their tongue out and nobody gets offended. Then there's the New Zealand participating in the America's Cup yachting regatta and whether you know about yachting or not, it's a very tough business to try and win. Then there's the epic Lord of the Rings movies and our musicians and singers and actors and other sports people, which does not mean for small, far distant countries like New Zealand that cultural diplomacy is a thing of the past. It does not. Nor should we accept that the age of YouTube and Google has made cultural diplomacy redundant just because it has fundamentally changed many aspects of traditional diplomacy. The current age and ease of international travel is a factor as well. Though you wouldn't think so, Mr. Chairman, coming 38 hours to get to this conference from New Zealand. If you want to see uh, Russian ballet, you get a plane to Moscow. If you like Chinese theater, you go to Beijing. 
If you want puppet theater, go to Indonesia, and jazz, well, you can go to New Orleans. The same applies to whatever aspect of cultural endeavor you can name. We are, so many of us, mobile in a way inconceivable to earlier generations. This in itself is changing the way we view the world and the way the world sees us. So the tentative present position is that there is still a role for cultural diplomacy, but there's no doubt that we're in a period of fluid transition. And for a small country like New Zealand, let's add some caveats and conditions. The most obvious of these is cost. Speaking as a former treasurer as well as foreign minister, cost is an important factor for small countries in what is a highly crowded and highly competitive field. At the best of times, the impact of any diplomatic activity is hard to measure. Everyone here is familiar with the demands by national treasuries for impact assessments, value for money analysis, and then the more transparent accounting of cost to taxpayers. The second point is that we have to be smart or smarter. In a digital environment where non-government factors dominate the uh, cultural space, governments need to be clever and sophisticated if they, have to have, if they are to have any impact at all. Activities will need clear goals, careful targeting and monitoring. And on the positive side, I have to say though, there is progress. The tyranny of distance referred to earlier has been defeated by technology. We are connected as never before and our geographical remoteness is no longer such an imposing challenge. So the question I suppose is how do we make the most of the opportunities that this presents? One can offer a few ideas, not least because many of us come from the wrong side of the generational digital divide. I'm not looking at some of you, but some of you like me are older than others. We all face the problem of having to marry cultural diplomacy with new technology. And perhaps the most obvious starting point is to be smarter about leveraging off what each of our countries is already successfully doing in the world, including the digital world. We can seek out our countrymen, already successful in their fields, including the arts, and embrace them as cultural ambassadors, using social media, traditional media, and other assets including our embassies in support of broader national objectives such as trade connections, tourism and educational links. You may have heard of our famous opera singer Dame Kerry Takanawa. Some of you may have seen one of the Lord of the Rings or Hobbit movies with Sir Peter Jackson as the uh, inspiration. Or the most successful sporting team by record in the world in the last 100 years, which is the All Blacks. Without that, these three would have far greater impact than any government minister or ambassador in promoting New Zealand on the international stage. Second, we should lever leverage off other events. We already do that to some extent. We've put a whole tourism industry around the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. Uh, it's been very, su uh, very successful. In key participating countries, uh, when we had the World Cup in rugby in 2011, in all the rugby nations that were coming, and 116 nations tried to, be, to get there, we use that to spread our message and our image. Third, we also need to look for chances to exploit what other players are doing, such as think tanks, universities, and the private sector, while being keenly aware of the independence of these institutions. After all, not everybody wants to be seen closely aligned with government, and we must respect that. In certain ways, there is a role for a more traditional approach. This is especially so when you are seeking to build new relationships in situations where there is little or no previous no history or knowledge and understanding between countries and peoples. Now, for example, advocating spending public money on cultural activities between New Zealand and Australia, our nearest neighbour, would be a waste of money. We know each other very well. But there are certain countries and continents where mutual knowledge is lacking. And if, as the saying goes, culture provides a window on the soul of a country, then a carefully targeted program of cultural diplomacy should be deployed alongside all the other tools of soft power. Now, throughout this talk today, you will have noticed a traditional approach to defining cultural diplomacy.
but in a long career, one will have observed many aspects of it. For example, the invitations that have come uh, out of Asia uh, to come to Pacific leaders in the South Pacific, who are then taken to Asia and fated like they are the latest Caesar in the main streets of Rome. It has been a most seductive experience. And frequently, those leaders come back home with no connection to the reality that they have just experienced. And often, there are policy decisions made as a consequence which have, for these countries, been a disaster. Now, that's the reason why I've taken a traditional approach. It's deliberate. It, music, it means using cultural programs and activities to help secure wider national objectives as part of foreign policy. Some will disagree with this and would prefer a broader interpretation. Some at this conference have spoken in that form. Now, there are those who will see the exchange of knowledge, insights, and understanding that can be gained through cultural exchanges as a means and an end unto themselves. Well, that's fair enough, and of course, they're not wrong. But the point is that the taxpayer can't be expected to foot the bill, uh, to foot the account or the bill every time an artist, a writer, or a mu musician steps offshore. In fact, if that were the case, it would be more reminiscent of something from the Soviet era than our current age. Now, some say the internet is the answer to those who argue for a taxpayer-funded global cultural exchange program. Now, if haphazard, directionless, unfocused outcomes are being sought, then they would be right. The internet is the answer. However, cultural diplomacy is far too important to be left to accident. And the one aspect that none of us sh should ignore, particularly for those of us who come from the West, is the pursuit of the secular state with all its worldly and materialistic objectives. In our abandonment of, religi of, in our abandonment of religious teaching, for example, we risk the danger of ignorance of the religions of others and other cultures on how they think. In failing to teach our own people about certain aspects of religion, we have taken it that no religion matters at all. And that's not the way the rest of the world is. That ignorance can soon shade into enormous misunderstanding and serious unnecessary problems. Thus, the role of education in the culture of others is more important than ever. Without it, how can cultural diplomacy be effective? Other contributions can also make a difference, but none more than knowing history. For those that don't know history soon repeat its mistakes. There's a wide range of activities that count from the work of our diplomats and peacekeepers, public diplomacy more generally, our overseas development aid assistance programs, our sports teams, and yes, individual New Zealanders who make their mark on the world stage, just to mention a few. This is a perspective from a country in the Southwest Pacific, centered below the biggest economic theater in the world with all the social and security concerns that that presents. The South Pacific is a huge part of the globe, even though most of it is ocean. Perhaps at one of your future events, in addition to focusing on the rise of Asia and the connectivity with China and uh, the other Asian economies and India, you might also consider cultural diplomacy in small island states that have seriously diverse cultures. Probably the biggest contribution to cultural diplomacy will be made outside all official channels. Social media has made the world a much smaller place. People are making friends with each other across cultures and the physical barriers of distance. The pain from the recent hurricane in the Philippines, described here this morning, was felt in New Zealand. We all saw the terrible tidal wave in Japan. Many cultures contacted us when we had a tragic earthquake recently, three years ago, in Christchurch, New Zealand. In the Middle East uprisings, ordinary citizens sent images across the world. Much of the news did not come from official sources. Groups of people were calling across the globe to other groups of people. This is the new cultural diplomacy we all need to understand. It's being done without any order or direction, which can be either very positive or very alarming, depending on the point, of course, of view you take. And we must all remember that our perception of ourselves 
can be at odds with the images that shoot across cyberspace. I mean, most of you have seen the cooking program with Nigella. What is your view today after the recent court case? A mobile phone picture of a mother sheltering a child during a gun battle is far more powerful than a thousand words of diplomacy. On a lighter note, the recent impact of the Gangnam style, something like riding a horse without a horse, race across the world <laughs> from South Korea. It is like riding a horse without the horse. Hundreds of millions sharing a harmless craze on YouTube and laughing together may be as helpful for world peace as some meetings at the United Nations. After all, we leave the selection of governments to the people. Why not sometimes place our trust in their common sense over cultural diplomacy? Let's face it, it's hard to fight when you are dancing around pretending to be a horse. In conclusion, never lose an opportunity in cultural diplomacy to sell a product having got to know uh, your customer. I hope one day soon you'll come to New Zealand. Thank you very much.